Good night, Separia. And Cedrus. And Irene. Mondezi. Avocat. San Francisco. Otahiti, yeah. Faisabad West, Siparia. Yeah. Did I say Rosilak? Anan and Rosilak? Yeah. Rosilak too. Yeah. Who will leave out? Labre. Labre. Yeah. Most importantly, most importantly, good night, Shagonas East. Yeah. For the last 10 years, 10, 10 days, it feels like 10 years. I've been in Sangre Grande five times to speak on the platform we have mounted in Sangre Grande. And I told them in Sangre Grande, all you're breaking up my relationship with Shagonas East. I spend it too, spending too much time away from home. This is my third time in Separia for this local government campaign. And I want to tell all you tonight, all you also interfering with my relationship with my constituency in Shagonas East. I have a borough to win, and then I have a seat to win. But I want to tell you why I've been to Sangre Grande with some of my colleagues over the last few weeks, and in particular the last 10 days. You could wear your t-shirt, and you could wave your flag, and you could dance to all the songs that we have, the La Mo Peter, see everybody. But what matters is what happens in the ballot box. And sometimes as a party, we have fallen short. If you look at the results of the last few elections, you would see that in some cases, the turnout in the local government election is 25%, 30%. In the case of Separia, 50% and under. What it means is that half the people not coming out to vote, and most of the half that not coming out to vote belong to the People's National Movement. And if we could do better, if we could do a little better than 2016, Anand, Mar Anand Maraj and Rosilak fell short by under 200, in fact, under 140. And Anand Maraj is an excellent candidate, very familiar with his area. Unlike our opponents, even before he becomes a counselor, he's very knowledgeable. He has plans for his area. He wants to do better. And when you're in the hands of the PNM, doing better is very good and enough and easy. So if you come out and bring somebody out and bring more people out in Rosilak, Anand will get home. And then Maurice Alexander. It was close, you know. Under 90, 88. Very, very close. And I was, in, I was in his area twice with him. He's an outstanding candidate, an excellent platform speaker, a son, of, a son of his district. He goes into every house in the area. In fact, I walked with Maurice. I walked with Maurice last week, Saturday. And it is the first time I walk about, pass through somebody's kitchen. <laughs> The people make a roti. They give it to Maurice and Maurice keep it. I didn't get any of it. But first walkabout, I was in that pasture kitchen, stopped by a stove, watch a roti make, go in Maurice's hand, and up the road again to continue the walkabout. What could be wrong with that? <laughs> to the people of Faisabad, West Siparia, wants Maurice to get back in with more votes. And to do that, we have to stop leaving PNM people home on their bed sleeping. And we have to get them out. And that is all I came to say to you, Siparia, in relation to you taking this corporation. Because remember, I was here in 2016 when we were over by KFC. And there is where I find out that KFC in Siparia is not 24 7. Because all you keep us late in the meeting and everything to eat from Siparias to San Fernando closed. <laughs> but in 2016, we were sure we were going to take the corporation, and we fell short. I came to say, you have some unfinished business to do, and no better time than 2019. Let's get it done. The PNM is in the business of getting it done. And over in Sangre Grande, 
Well, it's eight and it's four four right now. And we've done well to hold it on. We have great candidates. In fact, I listened to your to your opening speaker, and I have listened to all eight in Sangre Grande. Some of us who speak on this PNM platform in trouble because we have some great candidates who will become great counselors, and we have a, 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 a train of people coming up in the PNM that are outstanding on the platform. <laughs> and up in Sangre Grande, up in Sangre Grande, we have, of course, the returning general, Martin Terry Rondon. His, his electoral district has a new name, but we expect that the results will be the same. We have a young man from 2016 going for his second time, Paul Mongolas. We have a girl, a lady, a wonderful, hard-working lady called Simone Gill Joseph, Valencia West. And we know those three will bring it home for us. Number four, Elizabeth Wharton in Sangre Grande, Northeast. She made it home in 2016 by 44 votes. And that is because we leave a lot of votes sleeping on the bed, in the outhouse, in the toilet, pass back for me later, my foot hurting, my hand hurting. We need to get them out in Sangre Grande too. And I was up there up until last night in Boys Town in Sangre Grande saying to them, a young lady and a hard-working counselor like Elizabeth Wharton needs to get home by a few hundred well. Because when the other people get home, they get home good, you know. Look at Meru. Look at Meru. 2,000 plus. 2,000 plus. Why can't we give our candidates that kind of number just by coming out on election day and doing? That is what we mean by getting the job done. And Elizabeth will make us number four in Sangre Grande. I listened to a fellow called Neil Joseph because he said, Neil is real. And Neil Joseph is brand new, running in a, an electoral district called Sangre Grande South. And there was a time when the PLNM held on to Sangre Grande South tight, tight, tight with a lady called Miss Trim. All you know about Miss Trim in Sangre Grande? A PNM stalwart and a counselor. And once Miss Trim gone, we can't seem to get that area in grip. Neil is a student of School of Business and Computer Studies, Mechanical Engineering. He is a brilliant young man working wasa, well spoken on the platform, and he could make us number five in Sangre Grande. I met a young another young man, another young man, Nigel Safe, in the newly newly marked out Manzanilla Fishing Pond District. His father was so much a PNM and his grandfather was so much a PNM. In fact, they say at the funeral of the Safe family, any Safe dead, it had Balize inside and outside the casket. So, so Safe, Nigel Safe, he's a bishop, he's a preacher. And last night again, I heard him on the platform. I was there in support of him and Ravi Lakana, another candidate outstanding speaker, somebody who could speak at length about the area that he's running in, Manzanilla Fishing Pond, and he could be number six for us in Sangre Grande. And we also have Rishi Lakan, former UNC counselor. Well, we welcome them. We find that they do better with us. And you know, when a UNC counselor comes over to the PNM, we know the voters can't say anything wrong with them. Because when they were there, they were voting them there. So they can't say anything wrong with them, except that they knew and improved under the PNM. And we have two of them, two of them in the Sangre Grande race, Ravi Lakan and Rajkumar Bagalu. And the other night I was speaking on the platform in Guayco with Bagalu. Well, since Bagalu, Bagalu must be in his 60s. Since Bagalu come in the PNM, he can't stop bouncing the man by the platform. <laughs> Bouncing, bouncing. And he fell short in 2016 by 200. And I told them in Sangre Grande, it must be easy to find those votes in that district, Komoto Tamana, to bring Bagalu home. And we don't want five. We want all eight, because we have put together good candidates, a great slate in Sangre Grande, a great one in Separia. And all you have to do is work to bring out our votes to bring it home.
And I know that land is a big issue in Separia and all over this Separia Regional Corporation in all the elect electoral districts. So I came here tonight also to talk about land. And you know, Sunday night, Maurice had me in Sandpit. All you know Sandpit? <laughs> Sandpit in what was in an area that used originally named the Tick, the Tick Agricultural Society Project. And the plight of those residents is the same as people around the country. You know, in a typical, you know, I was saying last night, we have opponents who like to have their meeting where highway passing, where the highway passing. In fact, we had a meeting in, in, in Boys Town, um, Sangre Grande, which is, not, which is not necessarily highway. And they had a meeting in the heart of Sangre Grande. And up in Boys Town, the PNM had quite a few hundred people. And in the heart of Sangre Grande, with all the bright lights, KFC, Royal Castle, I think they managed 50 people, including, including the PNM people who didn't get transport to the PNM meeting. So they decided to stay in Grandia and listen. And I was saying to them, you know, as a party in our 63 years, we go where we have to go, you know. We go everywhere we have meetings, in house, in shop, in yard, wherever. We may even have had a meeting in a funeral home already. I don't know, but I'm sure. But we go wherever we had to go. And in San Pit, they've been dealing with this issue of land tenure. And the people came out, very disciplined, very nice crowd. And they came with one issue and one issue in mind, this issue of tenure. And it is something that has affected people around the country. And I've spoken about it a lot. It's been a significant problem. There's been time, there was a time in our history where our records relating to land were well ordered and well organized. But as the country developed, as we moved from those large private estates and those became state land, and as some private owners abandoned their land and people started to occupy, we developed a problem in this country with, in relation to agriculture. People who had leases, for example, in Wallerfield and Carlsonfield, in Tick, and in other parts of the country, their leases expired and they were not renewed. On average, I deal with people who have been waiting with a lease that has been expired for 25, 30 years. That is more than a generation. And they have been waiting. And part of the issue with agriculture is these farming families, where the young people in the family don't feel motivated because they've seen their parents frustrated going with an envelope of, of documents, a white plastic bag with documents, a garbage bag with documents, every week, every two weeks, going to some government office, knocking from pillar to post, as we say, looking for this lease to be renewed. And I have said, in all other forms of business enterprise in the country, people have all the things that they need to make their investment. But in agriculture, our farmers and their families have suffered on on account of not having renewed leases. And we set in our manifesto, there are about 16 commitments we made in the PNM manifesto in relation to agriculture. Half of them deals with land tenure and reforming the system of land administration. And in that, in that meeting, in that meeting in, in Tick Village, there were a couple of people saying, but minister, two years ago, we heard you in Mon Diablo and you promised that you were going to deal with Tick Village. You promised us, and after that, we never see you again. And I was scratching my head thinking, but maybe I, maybe I, really, um, maybe I really disappointed these people. I make them a promise and I never come back. I never deal with a file. And all on a sudden, a lady say, well, anyway, minister, all I come to tonight, tonight is to tell you are waiting a whole year to tell you thanks from a lease renewal. And she dip in her pocket, and she pull out the envelope. And when she bust open the envelope, I realize it's a letter signed by me. And all the, all the files come back flowing through my head. And I realize that in, in that area, we had already granted approval to the renewal of substantial numbers of leases. 
for those who had provided all the documentation to the ministry. And a lot of people there were happy, even those who have not gotten their renewal, because they believe that the system is working, that the focus we have placed on the renewal of leases which have expired in relation to agriculture is actually working. And then there are those even in, in, in your community who have been on lands without approval. In fact, many of the most productive farmers in this country are on lands, particularly state lands, for which they have no approval. This country first we choosing and every day we proving we getting it done they only mama guy in we don't know they was thieving they cannot tell me nothing red is how we rolling it's pnm we voting we doing it right we doing it right we getting it done good for country good for party team rolling we building legacy so when you're voting know that you're building a strong foundation for this great nation this is a nation of many races different faces in many spaces so when you're voting know that you're building a strong foundation for this great nation Deparia, honorable prime minister and political leader dr keith rowley that is how you welcome him Thank you very much and welcome, Prime Minister. As I was saying, many of the very productive farmers in this country, wherever they are farming, in Orange Grove, for example, often described as some of the best lands in the country, not one lease has ever been given out in Orange Grove. And as we go through the country, a lot of productive farmers have been on land for which they have no title, no lease, no tenure, no tenancy agreement. We've also been working on, on, on that aspect of it, to bring them in. A lot of times, the problem is that they do not have the documentation. They have not made a claim. They have not filed something. They've not made a request. Or in our case, a lot of times is because the documents are old, the files are old, the matter has been sitting there for long, and we have to go and retrieve the files to bring them up to date. So that that is in relation to agricultural land. And we are confident in the PNM, we are confident in the government, that the work we have done for the last four years, particularly the last two years, will ensure that we'll continuously be renewing and granting agricultural leases so our farmers, our farming families, like those in Tick in Separia, in Sand Pit Road, will get their leases and feel comfortable and be able to do their farming and support their families going into the future. But we've also done a lot of work in relation to residential land. When we came into government, not too long after we came in, a lot of people don't realize that there is a lot of state land in this country that is leased for residential purposes. From Toko, in fact, right down through the East-West Corridor into Port of Spain, areas like St. Clair, on the East-West Corridor, areas like St. Augustine, Aruca, Curep, down through southwest Trinidad, all down to Tiche and some of the older developments in southwest Trinidad. And what we found as a government, in particular the Minister of Finance, made the observation that under the current system, when you have a parcel of state land for residential purposes and the 30-year lease you've been given expires, the whole process resets and you are now living on this parcel of land you may have built a, a, a house or a substantial structure. You're living there with your family. But under the rules as they existed at the time, we now have to do a new valuation of that land. And you're going to be called upon to pay all over again. So you may have paid rent for 30 years, and now it is reset and you have to pay all over again. I'll give you an example. In places like St. James, where we have people who in their 30s rented a parcel of state land for residential purposes, built a house and established a family. When they turn 30 years after, they're now in their 60s, the lease expires. We will do a valuation. The valuation in St. James may say that the parcel of land is now $450,000. And that 65-year-old will be asked to pay the state 
$450,000 for a 30-year lease of that land. And if they're not able to do that, they can pay a 3.5% annual rent over 30 years, which works out to close to $14,000 a year. And it is the Minister of Finance who pointed out to me that that was something wrong. We should not continue that policy because we wanted to encourage people to own their house. We wanted to encourage people to invest in the improvement of their houses. We wanted to encourage people, given, given the housing situation and the demand for housing, to maybe invest to expand their houses so they might be able to, in, uh, in, to accommodate their children and their children's family. And eventually, the cabinet approved a policy which says, if you are the tenant, residential tenant of state land, and your lease comes up for renewal, you are entitled to that lease at 30% the market value. It means in relation to that property in St. James that is $450,000, it is a reduction of $300,000 in what you are required to pay. There's also a reduction in the rental. So if instead of paying the $150,000, for the 30-year lease, you wish to, re to rent on an annual basis, instead of the $14,000, the rent will be $4,500 a year or $400 a month. And that makes it incredibly more affordable for people of this country. And that is an important, very important decision that impacts thousands and thousands of families in this country who live and have lived a long time on residential state land. But we also know that there are people who will be speculators, people who do not live on the land, and they buy a parcel of land from somebody who is in occupation of it, and they then come to us and say, we want to renew the lease. Well, the cabinet also approved as part of that policy. If the tenant, if the original tenant is not the person renewing the lease, if the lease has been sold or transferred to somebody else, that somebody else must pay the full price. And that way, we protect the citizens of this country while giving a benefit for those who need it. We also, as a government, recognize that in order to assist particularly young people, young families in the country, we needed to make more land available. There were young people in this country, there are young people in this country, and older people who don't necessarily need access to an HDC house. They have the resources, they have access to financing in order to build their own house, and all they require is a parcel of land to do so. And through successive ministers of housing, ending with my colleague, Minister Dillon, the government and the cabinet approved a program called the Aided Self-Help Housing Program, which again recognizes that affordability is the key to stabilizing families, particularly young families. And in the Aided Self-Help Program, those lots which were developed at the same time the government was developing lots for the Karani VSEP workers, those lots are being offered to persons who qualify at 30% the market value. So again, a young person, an older person, a single person looking to establish themselves and having access to their own savings or capital or somebody who could approach the TMF for financing is able to save three to four hundred thousand dollars on a parcel of land on account of the aided self-help housing program. And you know a lot of people in this country, including our supporters, including some of you who are here tonight, We'll always say, we'll always hear them saying, well, I didn't know that. I don't know about that. The government ain't doing nothing for me. The PNM has been in the business of getting it done since 1963. And I believe that the aided self-help housing program currently of offer is one of the best representations of the People's National Movement getting the job done. And let me just, let me just make something abundantly clear tonight. That program didn't just drop out of the sky. I was involved in Karani 1975 Limited. Dr. Rowley was involved as a minister prior to that and as a cabinet member during the approval of the VSEP for Karani 1975 Limited. And when the decision was taken 
to offer the residential plots to the Karani workers, a decision was also taken to develop more than the required amount. And we believe that for the Karani VSEP workers, we needed about 7,000 lots. The figure ended up being 8,885, but the development included was over 12,000 lots, and the additional 4,000 lots is what has been placed in the aided self-help housing program. So this was thought about since 2002, when the VSEP was de being designed. It was worked along, out all along when the develops, developments were being executed. And when we came into government, since late 2016, this has been an offer for any citizen of the country, wherever they live, at 30% the market value. Last week in Chaguanas, I talked about the Karani workers. And again, it is a PNM government that made a commitment in 2003 in the VSEP to the former Karani workers, a commitment of residential lots and agricultural plots. And we went out of government. And we came back in government in 2015, this time with me having the responsibility for land. And we met a significant amount of what remained to be done in 2010, still left to be done in 2015. And we have kept our promise to the Karani 1975 limited workers. We have been getting it done in relation to those workers. And last week in Chaguanas, I set out how we've reached and how far we've gone to meeting those commitments to those workers. And we've done it without regard to politics, without regard to where in the country you are located in, without regard to your race, without regard to your religion. It does not matter. The PNM in government gets in trouble sometimes with our own supporters for getting the job done, not for ourselves, but for all of us, all of us in this country. I want to end on a topic that everybody knows about, but people don't like to talk about, and I'm not talking about marijuana. I'm talking about this issue of squatting. We have a problem, and that problem has largely developed because state lands and forest reserves, which were supposed to be under the watch of people on the payroll of the government, went without many people paying attention. And across the country on state lands and in forest reserves, even, even in the forest reserves in your community, all through Southwest, on PSAL land, on Petrochin land, on all the lands of the former oil companies, we've had this issue of squatting. But we have to confront it. And there's no more significant area in Trinidad than Northeast Trinidad. Over a period of time, the pristine forest reserve that was once along the Valencia stretch, it, it has been overtaken by squatters. And we have people who are supposed to be looking after that. Forest officers, land officers, corporation employees, all sorts of people on the payroll going up and down that place and doing absolutely nothing. So in 2019, what we've found ourselves with in Northeast Trinidad is this. We have 2,660 acres of forest reserve called the Valencia Long Stretch. On those 2,660 acres, we have 5,850 structures of which 3,650 are residential structures. So we're talking about a community far bigger than any of the communities in Southwest Trinidad, developing there over a period of time, in some case over decades. Count the families. If you have two children in each of those structures, you're talking about thousands and thousands of little children growing up in communities where their families cannot advance simply because they do not have land tenure. Because I don't have to convince you in Southwest Trinidad and in Tiparia in particular, if you do not have tenure for your land, if a family in particular, a young family with young children, do not have a title to hold on to, they will never see progress and advancement. They'll remain in the same place at the same time. And it is in 2005 that a PNM government decided once and for all 
to deal with the issues in Northeast Trinidad. And the Cabinet made some decisions to advance that work. And between 2005 and 2015, there were always problems in relation to advancing the issues. In particular, we could not move because it was Forest Reserve. And you cannot give anybody a lease for Forest Reserve. Same way you cannot give somebody a lease for the river bank or the seashore. And the ultimate decision was to take those lands in Northeast, 2,660 acres, take it out of the Forest Reserve and move ahead with a program funded by the IDB to give out leases in those areas and resolve the issues for those families who have lived there for so long. And it is not an easy decision to make. It is not an easy decision to make because they have gotten there on account of lawlessness. But not only their lawlessness, but the lawlessness of those on the payroll paid to prevent that. So while we deal with that, we also have to deal with the issue of containment across the country. And we have not lost that forest reserve. In a separate exercise, through the FAO, We've been able to conduct an exercise across the country to identify those areas that are so built up and developed and encroach, encroach on that they must no longer be classified as forest reserve. And at the same time, we've identified those areas in the country where we've been investing in replanting and planting and developing forest reserve, forested lands. And we believe that we have enough acreage that could be turned into forest reserves to balance those that we are removing from Forest Reserve. And the net effect is that this country will have more land under Forest Reserves than less land under Forest Reserve. But it's something we must do. And finally, in relation to squatters, it is not just Forest Reserve. I was in Jonestown, Arima, a few weeks ago, following a cabinet decision. 291 families living almost in the heart of Arima for 60 years on land that somebody told them, go ahead and build on. And for 60 years, 291 families living there with no title, with no tenure, and with no understanding of where the future will take them. And the cabinet took a decision to regularize those persons. In my home community, you know I move. You know I move. Yes, Chagonas East. Chagonas East, but Rio Claro is my home community, I'm born there. Guaya Guayari Road, we serve an, a brick factory there. 189 acres, people live on it. Cabinet took a decision to regularize those persons once and for all. And across the country, your two MPs here, well, Dylan works hard and Nicole works harder. Every community in their area, where they have squatters, where they have people in need of regularization, they are bring, bringing it to my attention, bringing it to the attention of the ministry so that we could finally deal with those issues. There are many issues in relation to land tenure. There are many issues in relation to agriculture. But I'll tell you this, whether it is residential land or agricultural land, whether it is squatters, whether it is the Karani workers, whether it is the young families who require lands to establish their structure, the first step we must make is to get their information from them, work on the issue of tenure, and give all of them their leases. And if we do that, they on their own motivation and their own momentum, using in many cases they have or they have access to, they will, they will advance their lives. And our theme in this local government campaign is getting the job done. And if after what I've said tonight you do not believe, that the PNM is getting the job done, well, something is wrong with you in Separia. And if anything was wrong with you in Separia, I leave you where, where we started. We campaigned in 2000, 2000, 2016, right outside KFC, and you promised us you will bring this corporation home. You fell short. Do not make that mistake this time. Matthew Alexander needs more votes to be strengthened. And Anand Maraj and Rosilak deserves to be in the corporation. And every one of our nine candidates stand out head and shoulders above anybody else who is on offer. 
We have 109 outstand 39 outstanding candidates in this election, and we want to try to get everyone in. All will not get in, but we want enough to get in in Separia so we could take this away from the opposition once and for all. Thank you very much.